This morning we're going to continue our series called Pray Like Jesus. We started last week, and of course today is the last day um, that we're going to look at. We'll come back next year and we will look at a, this entire prayer as a 10-week series. Um, bit by bit, we will try and you know, dismantle the whole prayer and try and learn uh, more truths from this prayer, uh, the amazing the Lord's Prayer. Uh, last week, we looked at the, the passage in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. We saw how disciples walked up to Jesus one day and asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as we saw in the introduction, um, they, could have, they could have asked Jesus, uh, teach us how to preach, uh, because Jesus one of, was one of the greatest preachers. Well, Jesus is the, the greatest preacher that you would ever see. Um, they have heard Jesus speaking one of the greatest sermons that anyone has ever preached, but they chose not to ask that question. They could have asked Jesus to teach us, uh, teach them how to do miracles because they saw this man, uh, uh, you know, literally doing miracles um, uh, anywhere he is and at any part of time in, in, any, in any situation. But they chose not to ask that because I realized, we talked about it, um, that they realized that whether it is a great sermon or doing miracles or things of do, you know, or, or that are powerful, they can only happen to prayer. They saw that in the life of Jesus, and that's why they walked up to Jesus and asked him, can you teach us to pray? And so Jesus began to teach them. Today we will look at Matthew chapter 6, because I want to set a context for us to understand certain things about prayer before we, you know, continue talking about um, the Lord's Prayer itself. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 uh, through 11, Jesus is talking about prayer when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you truth, that is all the, this is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as, as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your father knows exactly what you need, even before you ask him. So pray like this. Our father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food that we need and, and forgive our sins as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. And do, don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. This prayer that's been repeated um, all across this world, at any places, um, um, any, any Christian meeting, any churches, has so much depth in it. I want to um, point out three things about prayer before we come back to the Lord's Prayer itself. A few things that you need to remember. Well, actually, uh, I'm going to point out three things about prayer uh, in, from, this, from this passage that Jesus talked about prayer. Number one, this is what Jesus taught us about prayer. That prayer is not a magic formula. That prayer is not a magic, magic formula. Many Christians think that if they keep on praying the same prayers over and over, God would simply give them their requests and say yes to all that they are asking, whatever they are praying for. Truth is, it's wrong. Jesus made it clear. Because of that kind of thinking, many of us treat prayer as some sort of magic formula that we can simply repeat it. It's almost like a magic button that we can press and God would simply give it to us a cosmic vending machine, God. But that's not how prayer works. That's what Jesus made uh, clear to us. That don't, 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 you know, don't, don't babble on and on uh, in your prayers uh, like, like the people of other religions do because they think by repeating the words, somehow they will get their answers. That's not how it works. 
In fact, when Jesus taught this prayer, he taught that as a structure that we can uh, use um, to, to, to pray when, whenever we pray. This is not, um, this is not uh, what to pray, this is how to pray when Jesus taught the Lord's prayer to us. Because God sees our heart rather than what we repeatedly say uh, through our words. It's not a magic formula. Number two, prayer is not for show. That, Jesus made it very clear. Prayer is not for show. God made prayer so easy to do that we can actually pray anytime, at any place, just making sure, you know, it's just that, that we, sh we should make sure that we don't uh, pray so that we could be seen by people. The best place to pray is where no one else can see us and hear us. The best time to pray is when no one else is listening to us or watching us. Prayer uh, is our way of personally communicating with God. It's better that we keep it that way. Not to treat us as a showcase uh, of our religiousness to people. I was having a conversation with one of our church members this week. We were talking about prayer. And he talked about how, um, you know, our prayers are lofty when it comes to people. That, you know, we use uh, all kinds of every, you know, uh, uh, words, every, every word that we know in the vocabulary, in our dictionary, we use it, especially when it comes to prayer. And especially when it comes to praying in front of people. That is, that is the one thing that Jesus hated the most. In fact, in chapter 6, verses 5 to 7, this is what he's saying. When you pray, you should not be like hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and corners of the street, that they may be seen by men. The same words in message version uh, is translated like this, that they would do drama as you know, they pray as if they are doing a drama in a theater. What Jesus taught you and me is this, that your prayers should be hidden inside because they are personal communication with him. That does not mean we don't pray as a, as a, as a, as, as a church in, in, in corporate. We pray together um, and there is a place for that. I remember Dr. Rajkumar Ramchandran talking about how do you pray? You know, when it comes to your food, when you're praying for food, pray it in like one sentence. God, thank you for this food. That's all you need to pray. Don't pray anything else apart from that. When it comes to public prayer, limit your prayer to two minutes. But when it comes to your personal prayer, talk as much as you want to talk to God. Your prayer should be long in your personal life, should be short when it comes to public life, but we reverse it. That's our problem. That's what Jesus is saying, don't do that. Prayer is not to show off. That's number two. Number three, God already knows what we will pray before we pray. That's the third thing that we need to understand. It's a very important thing for us to understand. In verses 8, Jesus says, Your father knows the things you need before you even ask him. You know, instead of putting us off, this verse should actually encourage us to talk to him more. The reason is this. Now we don't have to hide anything in front of God. We don't have to, you know, think about what should I pray? Should I even ask God about this? He already knows what you need. He already knows what is the condition that you are in. He already knows your sins, your mistakes. So it's, it, it, now that he already knows what you are, who you are and what you need, it's much easier for us to come and simply talk to him, and confess our sins and ask him to, you know, help us. I think when Jesus said that, that the Father knows the things that you need before you even pray them, he's trying to tell us, hey, don't try to hide anything from me. You can come as you are with all that you are. 
with all that you need and just talk to him. He knows it already anyway, so why keep it secret? But here is, some, here is something that you need to remember, that prayer works. So pray, because God will answer. Prayer is crucial. John Bunyan, the one who wrote Pilgrim's Progress and Pilgrim's Regress, these famous books, one said like this, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. You can do more than pray after you prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Prayer is crucial. Without prayer, nothing works. But here is, a, here, here is another thing that I want you to remember, that prayer is hard. In, um, you know, if we are honest with ourselves, many of us find prayer challenging. Spending time in prayer uh, becomes um, a challenge more when, it, when uh, you know, life, has, life has so many things that it brings into, um, to us and puts it in front of us, makes it difficult for us to maintain a regular prayer life. Amidst of all these pressures of life, uh, you know, it will become even more difficult for us to pray a deep and persistent prayer. Uh, feel a heartfelt connection with God in our prayers. That's why many of our prayers are more, mm, uh, you know, are recitations of words rather than you know, a heartfelt connections with God. But the thing is this, prayer is a battle worth fighting. Because it holds the keys for all the other battles of your life. If you don't choose to fight against the urge of not praying regularly because of all these pressures in your life, if you, if you don't resist that and fight against it, I know it's hard, but if you fight against it, discipline yourself to pray regularly, you will have the keys for all the battles that you're facing in your life. You don't do that, you'll be fighting those battles when the keys are laying in prayer. That's why Jesus taught us to pray. This prayer so beautifully um, you know, taught to us is, uh, as we looked at it last week, um, it's, it's divided into two parts. The first three um, statements are uh, of, uh, of God's. It's about God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. And the second half is about our needs. Physical needs, emotional needs, and spiritual needs. And that's what we are looking at today. The, the second half of, of the prayer. Last week we looked at the first three and we, we learned three lessons. Connect with God relationally. That's what Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven. Worship his name reflectively in reflection. Hallowed be thy name, your name. Number three, pray for his agenda to happen first. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Today we will look at the second half, the next three that are really important for us. Number one, well, number four. Depend on him for everything. Depend on him for everything. Give us this day our daily bread. This verse, of course, addresses our physical needs. We, 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 we can also look at it from a spiritual perspective, but it, it's straightforward, very simple, very to the point. It's, it's us talking to God and saying, God, these are the physical needs I have. Would you please meet me? Meet those needs. So first, God, once you, once you pray to God, worship him, uh, uh, and choose to make his kingdom as a priority, then the next thing that you're going to pray is, of course, for yourself. You're going to talk about your needs to him, your physical needs. When it comes to our needs, what this verse is teaching us this, is this, that depending on, on God is the most basic thing in a Christian life. Give us, give us, you're actually praying to him, somebody else. 
You're praying to God and he's saying, God, I can't have this. I can work hard, but I can't make, you know, uh, make things work. I can, I, can, I can slog it out for days and nights, still can't have anything in my hand. I know only you can give me. We trust and depend on God for, for everything in our lives. Psalm 121 verses 1 and 2. The psalmist puts it so per- beautifully into perspective for us. I look up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My, my help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. In other words, he's saying is, what he's saying is this, that my daily bread comes from him. Only, only from him. So I depend on God for everything in my life and in everything in my life. Psalm 18 verses 2 um, is another verse worth looking at. In that one single verse, he teaches us God's reliability in a threefold description. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation and my stronghold. Look at the threefold explanation of God's providence in our lives. First he says, God is my rock. As long as I am on God, I don't have to worry about anything else in my life. Remember the famous, uh, the story of this famous painting that one um, you know, the, the exhibition in Chicago, the painting of, 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 a, of a rock that was in the middle of a sea that was caught in a chaotic, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, um, um, uh, situation where, um, you know, this, this particular rock, had, this painting had this one rock in one corner while all the ships in the sea were caught up by, by the wind of, uh, and, and the rain. Uh, and you could see chaos in that picture, that, but just in one corner, this, this, this rock had one small hole in which a sparrow was feeding its, 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 its babies. Talks about that picture paints to us how God can be our rock in the middle of all the circumstances that are going wrong around us. That's what the psalmist is trying to say. The Lord is my rock. Everything may go wrong, but I know as long as I'm with him, I'm taken care. He is my fortress. That not only he's the one who, on whom I can depend on, I know that he's the one who's going to protect me. As a fortress, the Lord surrounds me. That no harm would befall on me. Psalm 91 is a classic description of how the protection of God is provided for us. That no disease, no pestilence, no enemy can attack us, can attack our homes, can attack our children. In fact, Psalm 91 goes on to say that, uh, that um, every uh, 10,000 may fall on your side, but nothing happens to you. That's the kind of protection we are given from our God. That's a providence for us. That in the midst of all the things going wrong, God is providing us, providing for us. In the midst of uh, uh, enemies that are constantly attacking us, God is protecting us. Then he goes on to say, he's my deliverer. Even if I'm trapped, he knows how to deliver me. He knows how to save me. Psalm 34 is a classic example of a, of a, a classic description of how God can deliver us. Sometimes, even from our own mistakes, David wrote this song after he was delivered from the hands of uh, the king of Philistine. He was running away from Saul, no place to hide for him. He doesn't know what to do. So um, he chooses, since I cannot find a place to hide in the land of Israel, I might as well go to my enemy who is Philistine and find refuge there. Somehow, at some point, for a moment, David lost his faith in God and made a bad choice. Like some of us. 
not that we don't love god not that we don't trust him but for that moment our circumstances have become so critical we have decided um maybe god is not as trustworthy as we want him you know we want him to be uh, maybe you know god's not here right now maybe i have to make decisions and you made a decision to go to philistines the one place that you know you shouldn't have gone so he ends up there only to discover that that is a bigger trap than what he walked out of only to realize that his life now is in real danger he knows that if the king of philistine um knows who he is the he's going to put me to death i'm assuming that before he delivered i know i acting as an insane person from the hands of uh, this abimelech the king of Phil- philistines I- i'm sure there is a moment where he realized mm, he stopped trusting and depending on god for everything and chose to make his own choices and he realized that's why i'm here in the place that i'm in right now i'm sure in that moment i don't know fraction of seconds maybe he said god please help me here please get me out of my own mistakes and god did the idea of acting as an insane person is a classic one for philistines because philistines believe that the people who are mad are actually demon possessed that if you harm a mad guy an insane person kill him the demons that are inside him would actually come and possess him possess the guy who kills the mad guy so that's why the king king says what do you want me to do with this mad fellow send him out and as he comes out david knows that god rescued him not from the hands of people who are attacking him but from his own mistake he knows that he is the guy who caused all his trouble and yet god came to his rescue that's the kind of god that's the kind of provider we have in our life so depend on him for everything remember this problems can be can either be ours or god's they can't be both think through that problems can be either ours or god's they can't be both once you entrust your problems to god they belong to god not yours anymore but if you are still carrying them but you really you never really actually gave it to him but this prayer while it points us to a dependence on god it is also pointing us to something else jesus is trying to teach us this through this prayer give us this day our daily bread he's actually teach, first he taught us depend on god for everything uh, that is one angle of that prayer at the but that there's another dimension for this prayer he's teaching us to be content this is from our side god is your provider so depend on him for everything for all your physical needs but learn to be content why give us this day not for one year not for 50 years give us this day what we need for today in other words jesus is teaching us this that the the, the 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 for a christian it's very important for you to understand as a christian it's very important for you to understand that your life must be lived with contentment not containment but contentment Philippians chapter 4 verses 11 to 13 Paul describes how contentment looks like not that i was ever in need he was talking about uh, giving and then he goes on to say not that i was ever in need for i have learned how to be content w- with whatever i have i know how to live on almost nothing or with everything i have learned the secret of life in every situation whether it is with full stomach or empty with plenty or little for i can do everything through christ who gives me the strength 
So verses, um, uh, verses 11 and 12, Paul says, I've learned this. I've learned to live my life with content. With whatever I have, I, I decided to live life to the fullest. Plenty or little. When everything is going well or nothing is going well, I've learned to live my life with content. Because I understand all that I have is what I have right now. But here is another thing. While he does say that I'm self-sufficient, he's also saying self-sufficiency is not enough because specifically for us, uh, uh, for a Christian, you need to understand that your self-sufficiency will never be enough until you understand your God-sufficiency. That's why in verses 13 he says, I can do this by the strength that comes from Christ. We are all like this little donkey that had this carrot tied up right in front of it. It's never enough for us. We're always chasing that carrot all our lives. We want to, when we don't have a job, we're praying, God, just get me one job, one job. So you got a job. Once you get a job, your next prayer is going to be, God, give me a little better salary. And then you get a better salary. But then our prayers are going to go a little further and you're going to talk about, God, give me a promotion. God, and then give me a bonus. And then, you know, our prayers keep going. And then finally you'll say, God, I don't like this job. Give me another job. With a 40% hike. For some of us, mm, we want 60% hike because we think we're worth it. I'm not saying don't pursue that. But I'm just trying to show you that's how we are. As human beings, we're never satisfied with what we received. What Jesus was trying to teach us is this. Learn to be content. Because he will provide you all that you need. So you need to understand that your life must be lived with God's sufficiency. So give us this day, our daily bread teaches us to depend on him for everything. And God, as he promises, will meet all your physical needs. I don't know how many of you have a physical need today. A job, a healing, a financial situation, I don't know. But I want to give you this assurance that if you can depend on him, if you can believe that God is sufficient, then your needs can be met. If you are ready to say, you know, I've tried everything on my own, but I'm going to choose to depend on God now, not, it does not, does not mean you don't do anything. That's not what it means. That would be foolishness. If you have a sore throat, you go to doctor. God gave you a doctor. You can't sit with a sore throat and say, I'm going to believe that God is going to heal me. Or if you are walking on the street and you see a car coming at 100 kilometers per hour at you, you can't simply say, God is going to protect me. I'm going to walk in the middle of the road. You can't do that. But when you do what you are supposed to do and then leave everything in the hand of God, you would see that God will come through for all your needs, all your physical needs. Depend on him for everything. Number two, uh, number five. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This one verse is translated in different, different ways, right? In same English, forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our trespasses, but the true translation is our debts. That's what Jesus was trying to talk about. That we all are in debt. Our sins bring us to the point of being in debt to God. That's what Jesus was trying to point out to us. You have a lot of debts that you need to pay to God. And you can't. 
When God chooses to forgive you, he's setting you free completely from all your debts. So when you are with all your debts coming to God and you are saying, God, I can't pay this back. Would you do something about this? And God is wiping clean everything and giving you a fresh start. Jesus is also expecting us, now that I've done for you, you need to do it to somebody else. That's the point, right? It's the most simplest, most often taught uh, principle, forgive and be forgiven. That's a prayer. Forgive and be forgiven. You see, that is a very important thing because it, It's something to do with our emotions, forgiveness. There are two things that will become an unnecessary baggage over our lives. And those are the two things that Jesus was addressing in this one statement. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. As we forgive those who sinned against us. Those who trespassed against us. Two things. Number one, guilt. That's why we are asking forgive us. Guilt is a baggage. For some of you are still carrying it. Things that you have done years ago, still on your shoulders. Too heavy. You're stooping down, life is becoming difficult, but you're still carrying them on you. That guilt has to be gotten rid of. Guilt is an emotional baggage you unnecessarily carry. That's number one. Number two, Unforgiveness is an unnecessary baggage, unnecessary emotional baggage that you carry. So those two things he's addressing right now with this prayer, Jesus says, when you ask for forgiveness and when you offer forgiveness, you're meeting those two needs of your life. Those two overburdens, those those two burdens that you don't really have to carry. You see, God has already died for your sins on the cross. No matter what sin you have committed, he's already paid for it. You don't have to be guilty of that sin that you have committed. You just have to come and confess and offer your, you know, your, your, your life to him. Say, this, this is what I am, God. You better deal with me. I remember reading a story about uh, George Mueller. Uh, Mueller um, you know how um, this, this man in, in London had established these orphanages with thousands of orphans um, uh, in the early part of this century, 20th century. I, at one point, I think there were more than 6,000 orphans um, in, in, in these orphanages at different locations. I believe one day, one, uh, one young boy walked up to um, George Mueller somewhere on the street and asked him, uh, if he can be taken into his, his hostel, this orphanage. George Miller looked at him and said, I don't know who you are. How can I believe that you are really an orphan? Do you have some recommendation that you can bring so that I can put you in the, uh, in the, in the hostel? The young boy looked at him in a, in, in, a, in a desperate gesture, looked at him and said, look at my rags. And that was enough. That, 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 that particular story, when I first read, it kind of put what John is trying to teach us in 1 John chapter 1. Um, he says this, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in truth. But if we confess our sins to him, like this child who's saying, I don't have anything to show you except for these rags. If you can come truthfully to him and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I messed it up. And I'm messing it up even today. But I'd like to get better. If you confess your sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and then cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession of our sins and our condition leads us to ask and then receive forgiveness. It's because we don't confess, we allow that guilt to still stay over our shoulders and we continue to carry an unnecessary burden. 
Now, here is something that you need to remember. Only God can forgive us. Only God can forgive us. Nobody else can forgive us. Only God. But the God that we believe in is a benevolent and merciful God. Sometimes we have this figure of God being a strict and, you know, serious God with a stick in his hand. We are scared to walk up to him. Even seasoned Christians are afraid to walk up to God and ask for forgiveness because we somehow get, over the years, we develop this picture of God being a strict God. Micah chapter 7 verses 18 to 19. The way Micah describes God is brilliant. I just wanted to read it for you so that at least you will get a hope today. Where is another God like you, he says, who pardons the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sins of his special people. You will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing love, unfailing love. Once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of ocean. Look at the way he's describing God and and the mercy of God. So give us this day if it teaches us that God is our provider, forgive our debts, teaches us that God is a benevolent God, is a merciful God. And just as we receive um, that forgiveness, we must learn to forgive others. Actually, I want to make a point on this and then move on. We must learn, sorry, we can only forgive others once we learn to forgive ourselves. That's a problem. You see, unforgiveness, bitterness, is the disease that is within, within us first. If you don't learn to forgive yourself of the sins that you have committed, you will never know how to forgive others who have committed sin against you. So learn to forgive yourself first. I remember reading the story of a, of a monk, two monks who were traveling from their monastery um, to different villages to, to evangelize and, you know, and from, from their monastery to, to other villages, uh, you know, as they traveled, they had to cross um, a, a river, a stream that has a very strange thing, you know, every time um, uh, it suddenly changes the flow of the water in that, in that river continues to change. Sometimes it's, it's almost just knee deep but sometimes it's, it's overflowing. That morning when they went to the village, it was just knee deep. So they simply crossed, went to the other side and began to uh, preach whole day and they're coming back in the evening. By the time when they came back in the evening, they're, 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 now the stream is full flowing and they have nothing to cross. There are no, no boats to cross, nobody to take them uh, onto the other side. And just as they were thinking about how do we do this? How do we cross? Um, you know, and since they couldn't find, they were preparing themselves to swim and, and cross, the, cross to the other side. Just as they were thinking about it, they saw one, one lady, um, you know, co- coming to, this, to, 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 to the edge of this river and, and almost in, in, a, in, 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 in cry, you know, um, crying that she needs to get to the other side because she has to go to, 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 to her home to, you know, to meet her children, things like that. One of the monks offered to her um, that he can carry her on his back. You see, the strict rule in, in monastery is that they don't talk to women. They don't look at women. So when one of the monks offered to her that he can carry her on his back, the other guy was really surprised. He, I mean, he, 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 he looked at him this this horror on his face and thinking, how can you break your vow? But, you know, the one who offered did not even bother. He just, uh, you know, took his, uh, took his uh, outer coat and, and tied her on his back and began to swim across the other side. The other one also joined across the other side. And then he, 
you know, untied his, his coat and she got down, she left. Now both of them are walking towards the monastery and even as they were walking, um, the, the one um, who did not carry, who was horrified, kept talking to him, kept pestering him about uh, how, can, how can he break the, you know, the rules of the monastery? How, how can you sin? How can you do this? How can you do that? You know, all that kept reminding him of, of what he had done uh, back, at this, back at the river. Just as they reached to the, to the door, he still kept talking about uh, how he shouldn't have carried the woman. Just as the doors of the monastery were opening, the guy who carried the woman looked at him and said, Hey, I took the girl on the other side of the river on my back. I carried her through the river and I left her there. Why are you still carrying it? Some of us still carry what Christ already released us from. So start forgiving yourself and that makes your life easier. You can then offer forgiveness to others. We must learn to forgive others because if we want to continue to receive forgiveness from God, from our benevolent Father, you need to learn to forgive others. Starting right in your home with your spouse, start offering forgiveness at home. Begin there. You see, Jesus in one brilliant stroke tied up what we need the most and want the most, which is forgiveness, with what we, we are most reluctant to offer, which is to offer forgiveness to somebody else. Let me read one quote for you and then we'll go to the last one. In a book called The Father Heart of God, an author called um, Floyd McClung says this, Forgiveness is often a process, not a once only act. We keep on forgiving until the pain goes away. The deeper the wound, the greater the forgiveness needed. Just as a doctor as has to, just as a doctor has to keep a physical wound in our bodies, clean from infection so that it would not, um, so that it would um, uh, heal properly, so must we do with our emotional wounds. Clean off bitterness so that they can heal. Forgiveness keeps wounds clean. Whenever we think of a particular person and heal, feel hurt, forgive them. Just tell the Lord that you forgive that person and you choose to love them with God's love. Receive his love for them by faith. At first, it won't look, it won't be easier. Uh, at some point, you might, you, might, you might think, I never feel anything good about this person. But keep doing that every time you think of that person. Until you feel God's love released in your heart for them. Otherwise, you would not be forgiven. So forgive and be forgiven. That's how you meet your emotional needs. Number three, do not lead us to, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This prayer, this petition is about our spiritual needs. C.S. Lewis, in a book called The Screwtape Letters, talks about the reality of a spiritual warfare in our lives. That you may not know this, you may not agree on this, but you are in a spiritual warfare. Every day, from the time you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior and chose to denounce, renounce everything that, 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 um, that, that was taking you away from God and now chose to look at God and, and follow his will, you are now in a spiritual battle. You may not agree on that. Some of us are indifferent to that. So he, he talks about that. There are two equal and opposite errors in which we race, our race can fall into about devils, about the devil. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and feel an excessive 
unhealthy interest in them, both extremes. They themselves are equally pleased with both the errors. The devil is actually happy with both the errors. Why? Because you will either become a materialist or you will hail a magician. Um, in both ways, you are away from God. If you don't believe in spiritual warfare, you'll become a person focused on materialism. If you believe uh, in, the, in the power of devil too much, then you would start doing things that are not really scriptural. You'll believe anybody, anything, anything that comes from the pulpit. Anybody who, you know, you know can, can, can say some words that can um, help you to overcome fear and then unnecessary fear. But the reality is simple that you are in a spiritual warfare. Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against the evil spirits in the heavenly places. Here on earth, in our life, in heavenly places, we are still at war. That's what he's saying. You as a Christian, you are at war. You may not see that, but you are in war. The good thing about that war is this, that the war is already won by Jesus. Until you believe that, until you choose to believe in the power of the, uh, the, the, the work of Christ uh, 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 that is achieved on the cross, you will still live in fear or you will live in indifference both affecting your life. That's why in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7, Paul, uh, Paul writes to Timothy and he says this, hey, I know the truth is that you are against dark forces, you're fighting against spiritual, uh, uh, spiritual forces, but you don't have to worry because for God has given us a spirit, not a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. The reason God gave us the Holy Spirit is that, that we can stand in power. There are two things we constantly face in our lives as Christians, trials and temptations every day. Those are the two strategies devil will use to attack us. Both brought, brought into our lives by Satan either to destroy our faith or to move us, move us away from focusing on God. But God uses the same two things, same things, both of those things, to build our faith and to trust our faith, to test our faith. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for greater joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect, complete, and need nothing. So God uses the same test and trial, uh, temptation, to build our faith. But he does not bring it into our life. That's what he says in verses 13 to 15. James and remember, when you're being tempted, don't say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong. Neither he, neither he tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it brings death to us. So temptation comes from God, from, from, not from God, but from Satan. But God uses that to test our faith so that we can build our faith. How does um, Satan target us with temptation? If you have not listened to anything today, listen to this part. Satan has four targets in a church. Number one, a new Christian. If you're new to faith, you're his biggest target. If you're recently accepted Jesus Christ, 
you are his target you see you are in a place of vulnerability you come if you specially come from a home that does not know christ and you are the only person who have now seriously considered jesus and you are walking in his ways you are at a point of vulnerability because you now um, are almost at the point of renouncing everybody else in your life and become all alone you are singled out from everybody else so you are the easiest target for him to attack you he will cause doubts in your mind about your faith about the faith step that you have taken just now about choosing to follow jesus in spite of all the religious belief that you have grown up for the last 20 years 25 years 30 years 40 years suddenly your life is now changing into a new direction and you are singled out because nobody else is standing along with you uh, he, he will attack you by creating doubts as to whether your decision was the right one or not what's more is this you are vulnerable because of the unfamiliarity with christendom you don't know the language that christians usually use you don't know the bible you don't understand what certain things in the bible talk about or about how do you face your your sin uh, your temptations how do you overcome sin you don't know how to change your life nobody taught you you are very unfamiliar you are in a very unfamiliar territory so he will put fear in your mind as a new christian that's where he will attack you at your most vulnerable point creating doubt or creating fear of what is unfamiliar to you there's a second target let's call them strategic christians strategic christians are those some of you who are at places that god specifically put you in that one day he can use you there your neighborhood or the workplace that you are working in right now are the people that among whom you are surrounded by you are placed in the middle of those who do not know christ absolutely have no clue about jesus christ you are the only person who know christ and he brought you purposefully and placed you there because at some point they all need christ and you are the only guy who can offer that to them they don't have hope they have never seen christ they don't know what it means to be healed physically they don't know what it means to be healed emotionally they have never known that they are sinners they don't they don't know that they need forgiveness but they will come there will be come a day when they would think about that and they would be looking for somebody to guide them you are there that's why you are there satan's second second most important target is that guy because he knows the kind of impact you can create in your workplace he knows the kind of impact you can create in your classroom he knows the kind of impact you can create in your neighborhood he knows that one day you are the reason why all the people around you will change so what he would do is this he would alienate you from everybody else because you live a different lifestyle you have a different set of moral values he will alienate you among them worse can be this that he can tempt you to live an inconsistent life that you say something but you do something else as a christian your words may be profound as a christian but your lifestyle may not be matching what you're saying if that happens satan already achieved his target in your life because when the person who is in need has to come to you he doesn't see consistency in your life so he will never come to you some of you wonder why nobody ever asked me about jesus christ in your workplace it's because they don't see christ in you they don't at least see the matching 
with what you say to what you do. So therefore, nobody's ever going to come to you and ask you questions about life. So it's better for us to check our lifestyle every day, constantly fighting the temptation to give in. A new Christian and a strategic Christian. But there is, a, of course, third category of seasoned Christian. A Christian who's been there, been there, done that, stood strong. But years of trying to live as a Christian can wear us off of our passion of Christ, in Christ. Because of the disillusionment, because of the con inconsistencies we see in other Christians, because of imperfect church like Capstone, you'll get disillusioned with system itself. You've been a Christian, you love God, but when you see this imperfect bride of Christ, you feel like, nah. You feel that you are the only guy who is walking in righteous path. Everybody else is unrighteous. What's the point of being righteous? I'm hoping that you will go into depression rather than go into self-righteousness. Because at least I can help you if you're in depression. Disillusioned. But as a seasoned Christian, you are tempted. Satan will tempt us by showing us all these imperfect Christians around us to lead us into a place of giving up. Don't. You are a seasoned Christian. You shouldn't allow him to do that. You know that Christian life, Christian journey is not easy. You have been there before. And so you need to be more sympathetic, more compassionate, more loving towards the, your fellow brethren who is struggling with an inconsistent life. And before, this is the easiest target. So I started with the but the most important target to the easiest target is worldly Christian. Let's call him a nominal Christian. The guy who comes to Jesus, comes to worship only because you want God to do something for him. I can give a guarantee that most churches, including our church, would be filled with people, a chunk of people like this, who believe in Jesus only because Jesus can do something for them. That, they can, that he can give them jobs, he can give them successes, um, and there is free forgiveness. That I can still continue to live in my sin, but I can come every Sunday and say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thine, in thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. That, my friend, if you are there, you better check your life and go to the third, second step. Seek forgiveness by us showing him your true condition and say, God, this is what I am. Please help me. Here is the big idea. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. In that one single statement, this is what he's saying. Express your faith in God's ability through your actions. This confession that yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever is Basically, a declaration from us saying, God, in my life, everything is about your kingdom. Everything depends on your power. Everything is for your glory. So I live my life in such a way that it shows that I work for the kingdom of God. I live for the kingdom of God by depending on your power so that you may be glorified. You can't simply say, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever if you're not showing that in your actions, everyday life. You see, yours is the kingdom. When you say yours is the kingdom, you're saying all authority belongs to God. When you're saying yours is the power, you're saying all mightiness flows from God. When you're saying yours is the glory, you're saying your victory, it's your victory that needs to be completed, not mine. Not my desires, not my goals, but your victory. That's what this prayer means. 
that our life depends on him completely, entirely, in its entirety, and our life is all about him. While he does, while he did teach us to pray for our physical needs, our emotional needs, our spiritual needs, he pointed us back to something else. Hey, remember the first three? It's all about him. If you can make him the priority, seek ye first the kingdom of God, then all the things that you need will be added unto you. Simple. As long as you don't do that, your needs will remain needs. And they will always be needs. You'll always carry a red card and write your needs. Till you change your perspective to the kingdom of God. Let's close our eyes.